So our next speaker is Christopher Sebastian McJetters. Sebastian is an author, editor, researcher, lecturer, and self-described flaming homo. <laughs> he splits his time between London, New York, and a whole bunch of other places. Now, I've followed Sebastian on social media for several years. So as a fellow vegan who is also queer, black, and gender non-conforming, I appreciate his approach to vegan education, his uplifting of queer and black folks, and his refusal to put up with oppression in the name of animal liberation. Sebastian's words are candid and, and sometimes, as he puts it, petty. But he speaks from lived experience and offers a valuable and needed perspective. So I first met Sebastian in 2016 when he invited me to present at a vegan social justice conference that he helped organize at the Whidbey Institute in Washington State. Meeting in person was an emotional experience for both of us, and he helped make that conference a truly inclusive and empowering space for vegans from marginalized communities. I'm really glad to see him again today and have the opportunity to introduce him at today's conference. So here he is, folks. The one, the only, Christopher Sebastian. Thank you, Pax, for that awesome introduction. Can everybody hear me okay? I'm a little bit taller than the microphone, so I'll crouch down a little. And the lights up here are really bright. Karen was right. I can't see anyone, which is actually okay, because I always get super nervous when I speak. And so it's better when I can't see you. Um, thank you so much for, um, to, to a number of people, um, like to, to Hope and Karen um, and to United Poultry Concerns for having me here today. Um, like they're, like, you know, I don't stand here in front of you like all by myself. I, I stand here on the shoulders of giants um, and those giants are women. Um, I owe them a debt of gratitude that I can never repay. Um, Carol Adams for like, you know, for, for leading me down a course of like racially interrogating um, speciesism in ways that I hadn't considered before having read The Sexual Politics of Meat. Um, to, like, to, to, to Jasmine Leva, who isn't here yet, um, but who included me in her documentary, um, The Invisible Vegan. Um, to like Lauren Ornelas, who I can't see out here, but she might be at her table. Oh, like there you are. <laughs> um, who, who will put a very stylish boot up your butt if she catches you with any of that slave chocolate. So like, be on the lookout for that. But like, you know, but all, all of these women um, and so many more that like I don't have time to name, um, like that's, like they, they are the backbone of this movement and um, it would be like irresponsible for me to not recognize that. And so yeah, I, I thank, um, thank all of you again. Um, this is definitely gonna be a challenging presentation. It's not fun. And it's an ever-changing presentation too. I actually did this two nights ago at Cornell University. Um, and even since then, like, you know, like up until last night, I was changing slides before I could email them in. Um, and, and send my presentation to like the organizers um, and I still didn't even do it right. I'm the kid that like never does his assignment right on time the first time <laughs> in, in school. But, um, but yeah, like this, this first slide right here, this, this presentation is actually called White Meat. Um, it's talking about like animal exploitation and white identity politics. I think that the theme of this conference is really, really important talking about overlapping oppressions because I think that a lot of us don't really understand the importance of like making speciesism available and relevant to people in a context that is like that is relevant to them and like one of the important things that like that I hope that my work does is to do that um, for people that don't understand that like speciesism is itself situated inside of a racist and classist system um, and and making that context available for people that's like oh I get it now like I didn't get this whole veganism thing before because I was just thinking that it was involving like wearing yoga pants and eating a lot of kale um, and that's like, you know, that's, that's, like, that's a stereotype. We fight against it. I don't actually eat a lot of kale and um, I don't wear yoga pants. Um, I don't know how many folks in the audience do. But um, this first slide right here is actually really important. Um, this, this was just a couple of days ago. I had to like, you know, take a snapshot of it and include it in my presentation right quick. Um, it like, you know, and I'll read it out. Like it's an image from uh, Yahoo News and it was actually reported from The Independent. The, um, the caption reads, Trump and his entourage failed to eat anything from special vegetarian menu prepared for them on an India trip. 
Um, this is like, you know, this, this is like, this is important. This is very, very relevant. The Independent actually goes on to say Donald Trump and his entourage failed to eat a single item of a special vegetarian pr feast prepared for them during his trip to India in an effort to please the famously carnivorous tastes of the president, the chef, a well-known award-winning chef called Suresh Khanna, adapted a number of famous Indian delicacies to make them more recognizable for their guests, and even included more familiar themes, such as um, items such as chocolate chip cookies and apple pie. But neither Mr. Trump nor the First Lady touched anything from the special high tea menu. Mr. Trump is infamous for enjoying a classically American diet featuring cheeseburgers, Diet Coke, well-done steak and ice cream among his favorite dishes, all typically American, all of them having to do with like you know what constitutes an American identity. Now, in addition to all of the like wonderful things that Pax was saying about me in his in their introduction, I'm so sorry. Um, I'm bad with pronouns. Like I need to be slapped on the wrist. But um, but yeah. In addition to that, one of the things that I'm most famous for is uniting people. Um, and you probably didn't see that coming. But I unite a lot of people, mostly black non-vegan people who really, really, really hate the fact that I'm talking about veganism and animal rights all the time because they feel like it comes at the expense of black liberation and kind of racist white vegan people who don't really want to recognize like the the, the racialized nature of speciesism and are really, really resistant to that. So I bring these disparate groups of people together and their common hatred of me, which, like, you're welcome, by the way, but, like, you know. But, yeah, so I put together this, like, you know, this, this, this presentation, and, um, and, and, yeah, like, I, I'm really grateful to, to United Poultry Concerns for, like, letting me come, but when they announced it, and, yeah, by the way, I am super petty because, like, I always read the comments. I know a lot of people say don't read the comments. That's bad advice for me because I'm going directly to the comments. And I'm extremely petty because I'm going to make your comments part of the presentation. I'll redact names. I'll redact names before I am fair and just. But I definitely want people to understand like you know what it is that they're engaging in. When UPC like you know they they posted it on um, their social media cha channels that I was going to do this presentation. People commented and said this has to be a joke. Pitiful. Um, okay, you've lost me. I'm out. This has to be parody, right? Please, holy God. Um, you know, and, and one person actually wrote a very interesting and telling comment. Animal rights and welfare have zero to do with color or race. Everyone is as guilty of eating meat as everyone else. I never said that, like, everyone doesn't eat meat. That, that was never a part of my presentation. This is classic peak white fragility right here. Um, <laughs> Like, you know, regardless of color or race, why is diversity even being considered an issue? No one even mentioned diversity. Like, you know, it's like the theme is overlapping oppressions. Like, this isn't a forced diversity agenda. Um, it, like, you know, why is diversity even being considered an issue instead of focusing on what the real problem is? Animals don't care what color or sexual orientation someone is. They do not care about diversity. They just want to be saved and live a long, happy life. Stick to the real facts and issues instead of what I suppose are alternative facts. Um, and then this person was just like, was just amening it. They were saying, yes, like, you know, like, like to, to the idea, the very notion that animal rights and welfare, um, like, have zero to do with color or race is absurd on its face. And I'll tell you why. Because white people actually make it about, like, color and race. Like, you know, this is, like, this is a, the interesting thing about, like, what I do. Like, you know, like, my background is in media and journalism. Like, you know, I'm not inventing these things. I am just telling people about them. And just the idea of me raising awareness awareness about it means that I have this mustache twirling agenda of forcing diversity here when the actual people who are making it about race continue to like you know to continue to racialize speciesism like you know com completely unabated uh, this this slide is actually an um, article from mike.com uh, from 2017, it says, milk is the new creamy symbol of white racial purity in Donald Trump's America. People think that I'm making this about race. I am not the person that is going to, like, crowds, um, and shirtless, I might add, and <laughs> juggle, like, just, like, chugging jugs of milk by the actual gallon. Um, I think that that is bizarre and absurd, but these people do not, because they see it as a sign of their racial or genetic superiority that they are able to, like, tolerate drinking and consuming lactose. Um, I know that Lauren, uh, like, you know, has talked about this many, many times before. Again, a debt of gratitude that I can't repay. 
Um, but but yeah, like you know, like one of the things that is like you know, my mind is it just like it's it's a bag of cats in here, and so like I like my background is in journalism and like you know and media studies, but like you know, but the the kind of work that I do it kind of defies description because I look at it as more of a synthesis of media studies, but also like political science and like and social psychology, um, and so like you know, this is like the, this slide is actually representative of that, um, and like and it was the like impetus for me to put together this presentation and like you know later the book that I'm working on based on this but this is from the um, the conservative political action committee in 2019 um, what you're looking at is Sebastian Gorka right here former White House staffer um, I'm going to mention very briefly Republicans and Democrats like you know like but but this isn't this isn't about Republican and Democrat as these like you know identifiers themselves but more conservative and progressive as ideologies and this isn't an indictment of anyone like you know I, like I I have no idea if there are like Trump supporters or people who are planning to vote for Donald Trump in the general election in the fall in the audience it wouldn't be the first time if there were but just like you know I want you to sit with these ideas and sit with the conversation that we're having because we're just documenting and we're talking about what's actually going on not like you know assigning blame or like making people bad for what they're doing but just recognizing what they're doing in the like sphere of social science um, or so, so, social psychology and political science but the quote actually says here um, from Sebastian Gorka they want to take your pickup truck they want to rebuild your home they want to take away your hamburgers first of all you're right <laughs> I do want to take away your hamburgers. <laughs> that was never a secret. It's on the website. <laughs> nice read, Velma. Um, so, so he says, this is what Stalin dreamt about but never achieved. You are on the front lines of the war against communism coming back to America under the guise of democratic socialism. There's a lot of red baiting that goes on at these conferences. And the theme of communism is going to come up again and again like during this presentation. But um, what's very interesting to me about this is that he couldn't be more wrong. Because if you have studied anything about like journalism or like or political science, you probably understand that um, this is totally a an ahistorical take that Sebastian Gorka has because like this is the opposite of what Stalin dreamt of. What um, little known little known black history fact, Stalin actually sent emissaries to the United States to study food production, and when they returned home, they had implemented mass production of hamburgers. So um, he, you're you're wrong, Sebastian Gorka. If you watch this video later, um, you are incorrect, and you are probably like you know like you'll you'll probably never atone for this, but you, you, you would want to correct that on your like Wikipedia entry. Um, but he wasn't alone. He didn't do this in isolation. This was something that was going on all over CPAC and the reason why I wanted to interrogate it. Um, you've got Jerry Falwell Jr. saying, I have 100 cows. You just let Alexandria Cortez, he himself, like I didn't write that wrong. That's how he pronounced her name, show up and try to take my cows away. As if Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez was going to go to someone's farm and like physically <laughs> steal cows. Like just, She's got she doesn't have that much time on her hands, I guess. But um, like Donald Trump Jr. says, I love cows. They're delicious. Um, Mark Meadows, with this Green New Deal, they're trying to get rid of all the cows. <laughs> And like, and, and like America's favorite Zodiac killer, Ted Cruz, he says, I, I hope to see PETA supporting the Republican Party now that the Democrats want to kill all the cows. I have really bad news for you, uh, Ted Cruz. Like, I'm not sure if you're aware of how they make hamburgers, but to be clear, they kill the cows. <laughs> this is a thing that happens. Womp womp. So like so, but like, like they they couldn't stop talking about this. This was just an ongoing conversation all throughout the conference. And so like like what what made me ask the question is like you know what is it about the eating of animals that like you know that that makes these people talk so much about it? Like and and it turns out that this is like you know this is a a signifier of solidarity among like uh, among these people, among a certain set of white people who view this as uniquely American. And so this is like, you know, an aspect of, an under-discussed aspect of identity politics and in particular white identity politics that we're talking about here. Um, and so I wanted to see, like, is this part of a larger trend? And this actually goes back to the beginning of the decade, um, like, much longer, like, if you've seen any other presentations that I've given. Um, and, like, you know, and, and yeah, like, this is actually Sarah Palin um, at the New Year's, at the, 
at the All-American New Year's Eve. She was talking to Fox News. I can't get the video to play on my presentation, so I'm going to play it here on YouTube. It's just about a minute and a half, and it's fantastic. Hey, joining us now is Fox's contributor and former Alaska Governor Sarah Palin, live in Wasilla. How you doing, Governor? And Happy New Year. Happy I'm New doing Year. great. Thank you. Happy, happy, happy. You, you guys resolutions? look like you're having a blast. Yeah. Heck yeah, I take them real seriously. And uh, I have three this year. First one is eat more meat. Don't worry, they get deeper as I go, uh -huh. the next resolutions. Um, I am going to try to help America. All of us as individuals make our federal government as irrelevant in our lives as possible. And then the third resolution is to take former UCLA coach John Wooden's pyramid of success and live it out because it's imperative, you guys, that we as individuals do all that we can to live with industriousness and self-discipline and selflessness so that together as a whole, our nation can be restored to her exceptionalism. Wow, that is fantastic, right? So Sarah Palin, like, you know, like, get back to the presentation here. She said that she had three New Year's resolutions in case that was difficult to hear for you. And I'm going to read them out here. Number one, eat more meat. That was her first resolution. Wow, that was wild. There was not like a band of rabid vegans that were confronting her. And like, you know, so she had no reason to say that. That was not like a thing except for to own the libs. Um, <laughs> number two make the American government as irrelevant to our lives as possible, and number three, and perhaps most importantly, follow the pyramid of success so that our nation can be restored to its exceptionalism. So what have we learned here? Number one, once again, eating meat is a sign of solidarity among people who identify with the concept of American exceptionalism. And it makes you a uniquely American person. And people who don't eat meat, whom I imagine composes the like, majority of folks in this audience, you're all communists. <laughs> you hate America and everything that America stands for. How's it feel to be a part of that party? So this actually is, um, this is, this is a, a really good one. This came from May of last year. It's an article in the Daily Wire, which I believe is run by uh, Ben Shapiro. Um, Gunshot billboard mocking the squad sparks outrage um, and incites violence, according to Rashida Talib. Um, the billboard in question was actually put up by a gun shop, and it says the four horsemen um, cometh, and cometh is crossed out, and it says the four horsemen are idiots. Um, signed, The Deplorables, and that's from Cherokee Guns. And you see an image of people who are in the squad. It is the four uh, freshman congresswomen, Rashida Talib, um, like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Ayanna Presley, and um, Ilhan Omar. And so you see them, and they are known as the four horsemen in this bu billboard. The advertising campaign says, and I quote, all right, my fellow infidels for Trump. Notice the religious nature of the like, language that's being invoked here, infidels for Trump. Due to overwhelming demand, you may come by the shop next week and get your very own Four Horsemen Cometh sticker. How do you do that? Simple. You eat a piece of bacon, tell us you're voting for Trump in 2020, then get your limited edition bumper sticker while supplies last. Snowflakes and liberals are not eligible. Sorry. And so, like, you might look at this and, like, you know, and laugh, which, of course, I immediately did. But, like, you know, like, you, you also have to pay attention to the language. Like, so much of, like, our political discourse is wrapped up in a, quote, joke. Um, and, and I don't even think that the person who said this is even conscious of what they are saying but what, or of what they are invoking. But how do you show your solidarity? You eat a piece of bacon and tell us that you are voting for Donald Trump in, do in 2020. And so what does it mean to eat a piece of bacon? Why is that relevant or why is it important? Because, like, you notice that, like, you know, you are, again, ascribing, like, you know, symbolism or iconography to, like, you know, the, the act of eating a meat. It is a culturally symbolic act. And not just any meat. It's a meat that is exclusive to people who are white and Christian. Because what do we know about Jewish people? What do we know about Muslim people? These are groups of people who have prohibitions against eating this specific type of meat. So there is a lot of symbolism that is wrapped up in this. Whether it is understood consciously or not, whether it is acknowledged or not, it is there. It is present. And the fact that I have to like explain this to people who are so super resistant to the idea, vegans, in fact, 
who are resistant to the idea of understanding the racial, racialized nature of speciesism in our society in the West, and in particular in the United States. It's like, you know, it's, it's, it's a tough road to hoe for me. Like, you know, like people, like, you know, like people were very vocally resistant to like attending this conference. I wonder if any of them actually showed up anyway. If, in fact, you are in the audience, come up and talk to me after the presentation's over and tell me if your feelings changed. Or if you still think that I'm like, you know, cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, maybe that's a thing for you. <laughs> But like, you know, but this is like, we're deathly serious here. Um, and since we are on the top topic of religiosity, like this is actually, oh yeah, some of you are very familiar with this. Like this is um, the televangelist Rick Wiles. I couldn't actually get the, um, the video for this, but, um, but there's actually a quote, Rick Wiles is talking about vegetarian and <laughs> vegan burgers. Um, God is an environmentalist, he takes this very seriously. He created this planet, he created the universe, and he's watching these Luciferians, that's you, by the way. <laughs> Um, destroy the planet, destroy the animal kingdom, destroy the plant kingdom, change human DNA. Why? They want to change human DNA so that you can't be reborn again. You can't be born again. That's where they're going with this, to change the DNA of humans so it will be impossible for a human to be born again. They want to create, you all want to create a race of soulless creatures on this planet. Once again, somebody has been reading my manifesto. <laughs> Oh, I don't know how that got out. Right again, <laughs> Rick Wiles. Like, you know, this is like, you know, and we laugh about this and we joke about this, but some people take this very seriously, the act of eating meat. I call it like, you know, the, the godlessness of meatlessness. If you are a person who does not consume meat, we are, like, it's incredibly tribal. Again, like, you know, you can't ignore the political elements of this and the importance of understanding this in a political context. Like, you know, like, if you do not eat meat, then you are not part of the in-group in this, like, you know, tribal, like, you know, in-group, out-group that we're creating here. You're part of the out-group. You're part of the people. You're one of the Luciferians who actually wants to create a race of soulless um, people. Like, and, like, and, and did you know that actually eating plants changes your DNA um, to make you not human. I don't know what you become. I like, obviously it's a very long process because I still feel very distinctly human, but like, but this is a thing that is being said very openly. Um, like, so, so yeah, like this, and, and people buy into it, like, you know, and, and yeah. So there, um, there is a term for this. Like, you know, this is an aspect of gastro-nationalism. Gastro-nationalism actually is a type of nationalism um, that, uh, where, excuse me, where food production is assigned symbolic value by those who articulate nationalist sentiments. Um, and domestically produced food is assumed to be safer than food imported from abroad. Um, so, so yeah, like gastro-nationalism goes hand in hand with white nationalism. And even the modifier white nationalism is redundant because nationalism was invented in Europe by Europeans in, I think, around the 18th century. Um, and any historian will tell you that. So, like, you know, so, so to even, like, ascribe the qualifier of white nationalism to the concept of nationalism at all is, as I said, redundant. And gastro-nationalism is a, th this is what we're looking at. We're looking at an aspect of gastro-nationalism where people are asserting their American exceptionalism by way of, like, you know, of eating meat as a sign of white racial solidarity or white racial purity. Um, and I want people to understand that this is not unique to the United States. Again, this goes to Europe as well. This is um, a, a, like a carton of milk made by Campina um, from like, you know, the Dutch dairy, dairy giant um, in the Netherlands. Um, and so they place a red flag on their milk to assert the national identity of where this milk comes from. Like there are very few like, you know, people who actually take like, you know, like who take their cues from vegetables. No one is actually putting like, you know, on their containers of, of soy milk. Um, I, at least I haven't seen it. Maybe it will crop up sooner or later. But like nobody's taking their containers of soy milk or hemp milk or like even their broccoli and saying, this is good British broccoli right here. <laughs> This broccoli was made right here in the United States. You, you won't find better kale or spinach than what was produced or like from like the, the idea of like, you know, of, of the, the amber waves of grain has been replaced in the United States by like, you know, by, by factory farms and the consumption of beef. Nobody cares about those foods anymore. We are asserting our national identity by the consumption of meat, not vegetables. And that's important. That's relevant. Again, remember that first slide featuring Donald Trump. Um, how am I doing on time? You're doing uh, thank you. Thank you. OK. Um, and again, like, you know, just to reinforce the point that this is not uniquely American, this is uh, from Australia. This is from last year, again, too. Vegan protest um, is declared un-Australian 
uh, by like the uh, Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison. He says in the byline, Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison has criticized animal rights activists as shameful and un-Australian after dozens of them were arrested in nationwide protests. So what were they protesting against? They were protesting against the farming of, um, of, of cattle, like of beef, of, of sheep, and of goats. What do we know about these animals? Because we're not in a classroom, I'm not going to force you to raise your hands and answer. I'll just give you the answer. Like, these animals are not indigenous to Australia, which means that he's telling on himself. Scott Morrison is actually saying that you are un-Australian if you are protesting the farming of animals who are themselves not native to Australian land. And so what does this mean? To be Australian, you have to actually buy into the idea and the concept of whiteness as introduced to Australia by European people. Um, and so like this is not to say that like native Australians don't consume meat, but again, we're just examining right now how we're asserting white national identity through the consumption of meat and other animal products. And so like, yeah, like to declare people un-Australian for like, you know, for protesting it, that is Scott Morrison telling on himself. And once again, another slide that I didn't include in this presentation, but like, you know, like Scott Morrison actually reared his ugly head once again to like, you know, to, to protest the eating of these pies in um, Australian like sports um, studios or like, you know, like the, the, the uh, convention center, I believe. Um, and they're, like he's filmed actually like, you know, like protesting against uh, the, the consumption of plant-based pies um, in Australian venues, which I thought was hilarious. And just, like, like I said, this just happened in the past couple of days. I couldn't um, include it. Um, and it's not just the consumption of, like, yeah, no, this is a great slide. This is actually one of my favorites. Um, like we reported this on VGN, like VGN.news is um, our, our uh, news channel that like I run with my partner, Tom, who's in the audience and I can't see him. But, um, but yeah, like animal rights groups are lesbian terrorists who want to um, take over the government. And so this is like Nick Katrina. He is um, a, a trapper, like, you know, a fur, um, a fur trapper. He says, and I quote, animal rights activists are terrorist groups mostly led by lesbians who destroy property and burn down animal research facilities for their cause. And progressives in their march once again toward communism. <laughs> Oh, communism are trying to ban trapping. And they'll get rid of hunting, too, after they take over the government of the United States. You're damn right. <laughs> and you're a little hunting, too. Like, you know, like, like, first of all, I love that he invoked, like, you know, it's lesbians who are running this, which, by the way, I am not opposed to. If I've got lesbians, give, give, let's give a round of applause to the lesbians. I would trust lesbians to run anything. If they were like doing this instead of like, you know, white men at the top of our movement, then we would have gotten a lot more shit done and we would have done it in comfortable pants. <laughs> Jesus. So yeah, I welcome our lesbian overlords, Nick Katrinas, and once again, thank you for reading the pamphlets. So like, this is wonderful. But like, you know, like just as I round this presentation out, um, I wanted to look at like you know some of the historical ways that like you know that, that that we create iconography around eating meat throughout the 20th century, and one of those is through the American cowboy. These are some of the archetypes that we look at. Um, you know, the story of the cowboy begins as the Civil War ends. After the war, cattle were in considerable demand, and Texas was the home of most cattle ranches. Texas would eventually be the leading supplier of beef for most of the country. Coupled with, um, excuse me, couple the promise of work with the desire for perceived adventure, many ex-Confederates from the southern states rushed west to start anew. The historical cowboy also included many former slaves, vaqueros from Mexico, and new immigrants. But all of those slaves, vaqueros, and new immigrants were phased out, and then you're left with this image of John Wayne. Like, the American cowboy is this idealized, steely, white person um, who, like, you know, and we can, like, we don't have enough time to get into the history of the cowboy altogether because I think it's fascinating. But, um, like, historians Joe France and Julian Choate actually, like, they summed it up in a way far better than I could, so I just, like, stole their quote outright and put it in my presentation. The American cowboy exists on three distinct levels. The historical level, about which the average American cares and knows no more than he does about any other phase of non-military or non-political history. Number two, the fictional level, in which the cowboy occupies a not quite respectable but highly popular position, and the folklore level on which the cowboy sits as an idealized creation of the American folk mind, this bringer of the American beef, this icon of American history. 
Um, and it's in this way that the American cowboy actually becomes the modern 20th century and 21st century invention of the, like, you know, the historical knight in our mythology, in the American mythological um, imagination. And so, like, you know, we see the coalescing around this American identity in this one singular figure, but the, the cowboy doesn't sit in this way alone. Um, you also have the American farmer, who is very, very important. This is the image that we think of. I actually typed into Google, which, like, if we ever have time to do a presentation on digital media and animal rights, like, you know what, that's a whole other, like, you know, that's a whole other ball game that I absolutely love to go down. But I just typed this image into Google, American farmer. This is one of the top five images that came up in my search. I was like, holy smokes, this is what we think of when we look at the American farmer. Farmer. This is like, you know, this is one of those images that is iconic. And you see a nuclear white family with a mother, a father smiling on their farm, surrounded by happy animals. And as most of us in this audience probably know, this is not what the average farm looks like in the United States. But this bucolic image is, again, an icon of Americana that we hold up as important to us um, and our American national identity. <clears throat> And this, again, is another article that, like, you know, I just added um, because this was very recent. This was in the past couple of weeks, and I threw it in the presentation literally 24 hours ago. Um, this is Fred Kessler, um, who is a Republican com congressman. He slams the Joaquin P Phoenix um, Oscar speech as out of touch and callous. Obviously, he does not have an agenda at all. He's holding up a carton of milk in the image that is on the on the left, um, and like on the, like I had to turn around and make sure that I oriented myself to you all in the audience. And on the right, he's got like, you know, he's like saying that's not milk. All of the plant-based milks are not milk, which is again, very ahistorical. Um, any food historian will tell you that. So he says, um, like, you know, in, I'm quoting um, Kessler here, Phoenix's uh, Hollywood elite worldview has clearly blinded him to the sacrifices and struggles of America's dairy farmers. When I travel Pennsylvania's 12th con congressional district and meet with farmers, I am always impressed with their work ethic, thoughtfulness, and desire to help others despite facing generational inter um, industrial hardships and a libelous onslaught from anti-dairy activists. I think this is really funny talking about the generational industrial hardships that actually were created by like industrialization and by the people who like are in power like himself, the like you know, the power brokers um, like in, in our political system. Um, an anti-dairy activist. The callousness he showed in his speech last night proves he needs to get out of his Hollywood bubble to see how, quote, real Americans make a living. Like I, like, and this is, this, is really, this is really telling because like Joaquin Phoenix is not considered to be a real American. Who knows where Joaquin Phoenix was born? Puerto Rico. Thank you very much. Like Joaquin Phoenix is Puerto Rican. He is a real American by every measure of like who an American should be. And to classify him as something other than a real American is just outright insulting. Um, but again, it plays into like white identity politics. It plays into the tribal nature of like you know the the politics that we're discussing here. It plays into the racialized nature of speciesism. He's creating in groups and out groups. The real. Americans are these farmers. The real Americans are these thoughtful, hardworking people who are so oppressed and abused in their everyday lives um, as they visit oppression and abuse on other persons who are not human. Um, and, and Joaquin Phoenix is not a real American. He is part of the Hollywood elite. He is another class of person that does not fit into his definition of who, what constitutes a real American. He does not fit into the definition of American exceptionalism as described. Um, and, and what's really important here is the almost call and response religious nature that the meat industry engages in. This is a quote from Beef Magazine, who hear these, like, you know, these dog whistles, if I can say that, I'm not quite sure if that species is, that are being put out there, like, you know, by people in, like, you know, who are part of this in-group, and they feed it right back to them. It is like, you know, it, it creates this positive feedback loop for them. Beef Magazine, which I love the fact that this is a publication. Definitely read industry publications because, like, this is, like, you know, this is wonderful. Um, they say the fight for the center of the dinner plate is on. If tofu, beans, and lentils become the number one recommendation as the plant-based protein substitutes to beef, then we've not only failed our industry, but we have failed the children. <laughs> Think of the children. Um, the military, again, like, you know, the like, military worship, the nationalistic trope of, like, you know, of, of patriotism and fealty to the American military. Hospital patients, nursing home residents will eat according to the new dietary guidelines for Americans. Up will become down. Black becomes white. 
and like, you know, like it's just like sheer pandemonium if people actually eat lentils. It, did you know that this is what was going to happen to the United States? We are going to fall apart at the seams. The beams will fall from the absolute ceiling. This is what's going to happen. And you all are causing this. You're bringing about the destruction of this country, the destruction of real Americans. I, <laughs> I didn't see that coming. <laughs> you all are amazing, by the way. Um, but I want to address, like, you know, like, this is, like, you know, that, that, that this trope also feeds into something else. Like, you know, the, 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 the farming of andro, uh, animals, so, like, the industrialization of the process of farming animals is part of the project of civilization. And I'll explain that because we have more Facebook comments. Why? Because I'm fucking petty. I told you that in the beginning of this presentation. So, like, <laughs> so, yeah, like, we've got a person that's actually saying, I'm sorry that reality hurts you, but I can't help that. Dairy cows are happy and well cared for on the whole. I actually worked on cattle farms, and those cows have happy lives, too. In the wild, these animals would not exist, although I'm very much in favor of bringing back the wild bison, which, by the way, were, like, you know, all but made extinct by, like, you know, by white Americans in their fight against Native Americans, just an under-discussed part of American history. Um, you should know that traditional hunter-gatherers also intervened heavily in the herds regardless. So again, humans have done better, and the bottom of that is cut off, um, done better than nature. Certainly there are things that can always be approved upon, but I doubt that's what you want. You don't want happier cows. If you did, you would work in cooperation with farmers. No, we don't want happier cows. We want cows to actually be free to live their lives. You want to feel superior in whatever lies you need to tell, fake videos, more of this fake news um, dogma that's being put out there. You know, um, fake videos need to produce, you will. Um, I suggest you block these commenters. They have nothing but bad faith attacks. This, is, this, this, again, feeds into the idea of the white man's burden. It's part of the project of civilization. We can do better than nature. We are better than nature. Like, we have an obligation, a responsibility to, like, you know, to farm these animals because it is for their own good. It is for these animals' own good. Like, you know, we, we, we want cows to be happy. We want to produce happy cows rather than actually allowing cows to live their lives. And yeah, there's a lot of commonality with, like, you know, with, with past historical racial aggressions because I've heard the same thing said, the same thing having been written by people about, by white people, about black people historically. So this is, like, you know, this, this, the, these commonalities are at play at all times. Um, and yeah, and this is, again, part of the white man's burden, this project of civilization. And um, this is actually a quote from, um, from, from Sigmund Floyd. I told you, like, you know, part of this is social psychology as well, um, with a, a very subtle nod to Carol Adams, because it also feeds into, like, you know, ecofeminism as well. Um, I can't see her in the audience. But yeah, like, this is fascinating. Oh, okay. <laughs> again, it's so dark up there. Like, you know, I wanted you all to come up here during the break and see what it's like. But... Sigmund Freud actually says, the principal task of civilization, its actual raison d'etre, um, is to defend us against nature. But uh, no one is under the illusion that nature has already been vanquished, and few dare hope that she will ever be entirely subjugated to man. I thought that this is fascinating. This is a three-part quote. This is only the first part. Like, not only are we describing, like, you know, man as, like, taking or undertaking the, like, you know, the, the task of civilization, but we're also describing nature as a woman. Um, and, and a woman that needs to be subjugated and controlled, but not entirely vanquished. We need her. We need her, but not that much. And she must be under our thumb. And so we go on, like, you know, we go on to read, there are elements which seem to mock at all human control, the earth which quakes and is torn apart and buries all human life and its works, water which deluges and drowns everything in turmoil, storms which blow everything before them. So not only is nature a woman, but she is a cruel, brutal, psychopathic woman, <laughs> um, a violent woman who desperately needs to be under the control of man. And with these forces, nature rises up against us, majestic, cruel, and inexorable. She brings to our mind once more our weakness and hopelessness, which we thought to escape through the work of civilization. So it is through this project of civilization, it is through this like shared burden of like, you know, of whiteness and often of white masculinity. That's, that's the thing about this. We're not just talking about like, you know, about one thing. We're not just talking about like speciesism in isolation. We're not just talking about racism in isolation. These are all branches of the same, all of the same tree. 
Like, you know, we're talking honestly about a crisis of white masculinity that drives this. We're talking about like the project of quote civilization and industrialization and the ongoing project of coloni colonization and colonialism that has brought us to this point where we're sitting at today. And we can't divorce that from speciesism and treat it as though it's just this one thing that we can focus on all by itself in a vacuum separate from these other issues because they are, again, like, yeah, everyone eats animals, but we don't interrogate why they do or the ways in which it's culturally relevant. Um, and we must in order to, like, you know, learn to dismantle it. Um, and, like, you know, as I wrap up, like, um, I just wanted to address the ways in which black people actually become consumed or, or are as used um, in, the, in the project of like white identity politics ourselves. Um, this is uh, Johnny Green. Um, my partner Tom and I actually helped to work um, on this um, behind the scenes. This is again from like uh, spring of last year. Um, there was a concentrated effort by the fur lobby to incorporate black people into stopping um, a ban on the sale of new fur in New York City. Um, and like, yeah, like the New York City legislature was ready to like pass this ban um, and like, and we were part of like, you know, a large team of animal rights activists who were discussing how we could like, you know, how we counter so much of the like propaganda that was being put forth by the, um, by the fur lobby. But one of the brilliant things that they had done, and I give credit to the devil where the, um, where the credit is due, is they had like, you know, they had gone to the social epicenters of black activism, the black church, and had solicited help from the black church in forwarding their agenda of white identity politics. Um, Johnny Green says, come get on the bus with MPAC on May 8th. Free lunch and beverage will be served. Bus leaves from like, you know, 7th Avenue um, between 114th and Convent. Um, the bus ride is free um, on a first come first ride basis. We're going to tell Speaker Corey Johnson and the city council we have a right to buy and wear our mink coats. I don't know a lot of black people that have mink coats. <laughs> why are you doing this? And why are you doing this, Johnny Green, in May when it's hot? <laughs> You have no business doing this. Who paid you? And so that's my question, like immediately. Like, <clears throat> and this is like, you know, th that one was on Facebook. This one was on Twitter. It's come get on the bus. People were just like outraged. They're like, yeah, like get on the bus. Like, it, this is insulting to me, actually, like on an individual and like, you know, and, and on an, a systemic level. Because once again, if we don't address the racism that is rampant inside of the animal rights community, there's absolutely no reason why, like, you know, they, these people should have been co-opted. But they were able to do that. They were able to, like, you know, to, to steal our lunch money on our watch in our own house because we were sleeping on the job, because we we're so desperate in the animal rights community, in the mainstream movement, to divorce race from speciesism. These should have been our natural allies, but we didn't want them. And we left them out in the cold. And you know what happened? The fur lobby welcomed them lovingly into their very generous bosom. And all of you in this room should be as insulted and outraged as I am. And shame on you if you're not. Shame on you if you're not. They are taking our pants down right now and they're doing it all the time because we refuse to address the racism that is rampant in our movement. But if we want to be successful, if we want to achieve animal liberation, we can't divorce it from black liberation. It is irresponsible for us to do so. Thank you. Um, so like I'm running out of time here and as I come up, like these are just like images of the actual protest. You see a bunch of black people holding up, like, you know, signs, um, homemade signs, but you see that the people who are actually distributing the signs are not black. Um, you see the coalition of Blacks for Fur. Um, this was actually a Facebook group that was created. And again, my partner, Tom, actually took an image of, like, you know, he said, like, I wonder who are the people who are, like, you know, in the coalition of blacks for fur. If you look at, like, you know, the, the list of people, and perhaps it's grown since the, the time that we took this image, but, like, you know, none of those people are black, by the way. And, in fact, the very first person's name is Becky. <laughs> which I adore. Um, but, yeah, like, you know, like, and, like, and I'm, I'm equally insulted by black people who don't want to include animal rights um, work into our, like, you know, work of black liberation because that, too, is ahistorical. And this is a quote from Janine Africa, who is part of the Philadelphia MOVE organization. I hope that someone else actually has, gets a chance to talk about the Philadelphia MOVE organization um, because I am just about out of time. But, like, yeah, Janine Africa says, we demonstrated against puppy mills, zoos, circuses, any form of enslavement of animals. We demonstrated against Three Mile Island. We demonstrated against police brutality, and we did so uncompromisingly. Slavery never ended. It was just disguised. I had actually written an essay in homage to that quote. 
Um, and you read here, this is Ed Pilkington writing for The Guardian. He was talking about like um, John Africa. Black liberation, animal liberation, the two are as one with a move. Black liberation, animal liberation, the two were as one. And we seem to forget this in our history, that when we actually choose solidarity, over division, when we actually choose to extend solidarity to those who have less privilege than us, then the system actually fears that more than anything else. Don't forget that. Don't forget that. It is my obligation as a black person to extend solidarity to animals. But it is also your obligation as white people, yes, I'm talking to the white people in the audience, to extend solidarity to black people and not skip over us and just like leapfrog us directly to animals. We need your solidarity in order to be successful because we are all in this together and we need to recognize the importance of that. This is my very last slide. Solidarity is not a matter of altruism. It comes from the inability to tolerate the affront to our own integrity of passive or active collaboration um, in the oppression of others and from the deep recognition that, like it or not, lib our liberation is bound up with that of every other being on this planet. Like it or not, our liberation is bound up with that of every other being on this planet, irrespective of our race, gender, social class, ability, or species. Thank you all so much for listening to me today. Hi, so there's a lot of white people in the room as you commented. I know, right? <laughs> I'm um, happy about that. Thank you, white people, for coming. <laughs> Yeah, so how do we, I, I mean, beyond, like, you give speeches and stuff, which is really cool, but how can we as, like, day-to-day -day activists, as day-to-day -day people and leaders sort of empower minority voices, like, like those that you've highlighted? Like, how can we actually create that culture of belonging for, for minorities? Yeah, like, uh, that's, that's a really great question. It's not really easy to answer it in, uh, like, a couple of words. Um, but it is a daily work. It is a daily work. If you are present on social media, priorito prioritize the work of, like, you know, of, of people who are marginalized in our community, not just by race, but by social class, by gender, by ability. Like, you know, like, prioritize the work of education, like, you know, for others, but also and specifically for yourself. There is so much that I didn't understand about, like, disability um, or, like, you know, or, or, or representation for, like, you know, inclusion of people who have disabilities until I actually started studying it. And I'm like, oh, wow, I actually need to talk about this much more than I actually do, especially in like the, the sphere of like of digital media and social media of which I'm exclusively like, you know, a part every single day. And incorporating that into my work has been so valuable because what I've learned is that when we meet the needs of people who have the most extreme need, and I borrow this actually from the like philosophy of Microsoft of all places, like we address everybody's concern. We make it more available to everyone. And so like everyone benefits from this. You're never harmed by greater inclusion. Although sometimes we seem to think that like, you know, that's going to be like, you know, that, that's going to come at the expense of our own project. It rarely ever does when it's done right. So thank you for that question. I hope that I answered that one. One more? Do we Anybody? have time for another or are we out of time? I'm looking at you. Okay, we're Please out of time. End. Oh. <laughs> I love that sign. It's like, thank no, Thank you to stop. our time keepers so I don't have to be the bad person. <laughs> Big hand for Christopher Sebastian. I'm so glad this was recorded because there's a lot of quotable and memeable stuff <laughs> that was mentioned in the last hour.